Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I uh, struggle to make the link. I'm certainly not an expert in uh, beta. I can maybe talk about uh, beta carotene, which is a color that is used in f food and beverage. Um, and I'm not even going to talk about emerging markets. I'm going to talk about something called uh, high growth markets. Um, what I'll do is I'll just give you a little bit of um, uh, an overview of the fragrance and flavor industry, talk about why um, uh, high growth markets are so important to, to Givadon, and then really what, uh, what Givadon is doing in terms of its presence in, in high growth markets. You know, you use um, the products that Givadon produces every day. 25% of everything that you put in your supermarket, unless you're only drinking water, um, is a Givaudan fragrance or flavor. We hold 25% of the market. Um, and so really from the moment that you wake up in the morning and brush your teeth, uh, to the moment that you go to bed in the evening and put uh, cream on your face, you're using a product that, uh, that contains a fragrance or contains a flavor. So really we touch you and millions of consumers around the world every day. We, um, and maybe one of the misconceptions on, on, uh, on Givaudan, you know, we serve thousands and thousands of customers on a daily basis. So we do serve the multinational customers, but we also serve what we call the local and regional customers. You know, some other customers or some other companies that have been cited here are, are customers of ours. We serve what we call local and regional customers. We also serve a private label. And you see many of the, the, the brands and the products that we actually go into. So food and beverage, 50% of our sales are in uh, flavor. And then the other 50% is in what we call house and personal care, household personal care, or fine fragrance or perfume. And typically, if you look at the cost of a fragrance or flavor, we are a very, very small amount into the cost of the final product. Something that doesn't matter whether you call a, um, a market, a mature market, a high growth or an emerging market, is that ultimately people repurchase products because they like the smell or because they like the taste. So the first time that you buy a product, you buy it because of the marketing, uh, you buy it because you've uh, seen the advert on the TV, but ultimately if you don't like the smell, if you don't like the taste, you will not repurchase. And so really the fragrance uh, is the key driver behind a consumer repurchase. Why do you buy a perfume? You buy a perfume because it smells great. But also why do you buy a yogurt? You buy a yogurt because you like the taste. So the first time you buy it, you believe it's good for you, it contains a probiotic, but ultimately, and if you have children, I'm sure you know this, if they don't like the taste, they will not repurchase again. So repurchase is driven by fragrance and flavors. A highly consolidated market, um, actually we are four players that um, actually make up around 65% of the market. You'll notice actually nobody, uh, none of the players come from what we'll call high growth markets. So um, Givaudan is the leader with 25% and uh, you see actually our neighbor Ferminiche uh, is the second player in the market. Third is IFF and fourth is, uh, is Simrise. The top 10 players in the market hold around 90% and many, many barriers to entry into this market. There has been no new entrant in this market over the last 100 years. So high barriers to entry, <laughs> high barriers to entry um, and many barriers. So it's not just a question of technology, it's understanding the consumer, it's, uh, it's really developing products, it's raw material sourcing, which I will also talk about, but multifaceted uh, barriers to entry. I talk very quickly about uh, why we call it uh, high growth markets. Um, you know, the first is really from an economic perspective, and you know, Jonathan and Wolfgang can certainly talk about this much better than I. But if you look at, um, you know, if you look at equivalent purchasing power parity, really today high growth markets are the biggest driver in terms of demand. We tend to look actually more at the potential of these markets. And I will come back to many of the drivers of these markets. We're looking very much at 
population and urbanization. So, you know, we are not interested in some cases in countries. We're really interested in urbanized populations. We're not interested in Nigeria. We're interested in Lagos as a population, as an example. And high growth for us indicates the potential and the growth capacity of these markets. A couple of things that are not on here, um, and actually I was discussing last night with uh, Constantino, you know, also for our employees and for our customers, to talk about emerging markets is, really gives the wrong perception. <coughs> we talk about the potential of a market. To say to an Indian employee, you're an emerging market employee, one day you're going to make it, it just doesn't give the right message. And it's certainly the same when we talk about customers. So high growth is more about the potential. And many of the, the challenges uh, that we face, um, that we see in, let's say, mature markets, if we talk about things like levels of uh, diabetes in many countries, you have many uh, countries with much li higher levels of diabetes in high growth markets, and customers of Givaudan who look to reduce sugar content to address some of these markets. Um, you know, levels of technology in high growth markets are as high in terms of usage as mature markets. So really for us it's a, a high growth market uh, uh, story as opposed to an emerging market story. Maybe just one um, number to take away from this slide. You see that 85% of population growth over the next 15 years will come from Asia and from Africa. Population growth for us is important, but actually what's more important for us is, is urbanization. When people move into the cities, they consume packaged goods, they consume food and beverage, and HPC, household and personal care, that contains fragrances and flavors. And so as people move into cities and as people's purchasing, purchasing power increases, they consume more fragrances and con consume more flavors. And if you just look at the, at the urbanization rates today in China, you know, ur urbanization rates are around 50%, expected to grow to, to 70%. Urbanization today in the US is around 80%. Actually in Brazil, urbanization is higher in Brazil, around 85% compared to the US. So a higher level of urbanization. What's really driving the growth in markets like uh, Brazil is actually consumer spending power. We, um, we think long-term and we communicate financially uh, long-term. We, we, we have a five-year strategy. Um, for those financial analysts that uh, look at quarterly EPS, I'm sorry, we're not one of those companies. Um, so we give a five-year strategy, uh, 2016 to 2020, really split into, into three areas. And you see the first is growing with our customers. And the first, really the first uh, area focus is what we call high growth markets. 80% of our growth over the next five years will come from high growth markets. The second pillar is uh, what we call delivering with excellence. So it's how do we convert that growth of four to five percent into free cash flow in the most uh, efficient way. And the third is, is what we call partnering for shared success. So how do we make sure that we have the right people in the right countries? And how do we make sure that our supplier base continues to, to deliver the products that we want, particularly as more and more of a trend towards what we call natural uh, products? Maybe a, a more um, down-to-earth example, and I took uh, just one here, uh, Latin America, and in particular, if you look at Brazil, maybe some surprising facts for you. Brazil is the number two market today for deodorants. Okay. It used to be actually the number one market for fine fragrance, but you know, because of the weakness of the Brazilian real, it's now number two. Many years ago, if you go back 10, 15 years ago, people said perfume, fine fragrance, it's Paris and it's New York. Okay. Now really, Brazil, as you see, is the second market. Um, it's the number two also for what we call for bar soap or, or, or toilet soap, and it's the number three market for, for hair care. So you can see how a single country can really dominate a, a particular segment. Brazilians love scent. It's very, very simple. Uh, 
Um, and you, you, know, you can also see how local customers capture a market like that. And for, for those of you that know uh, the companies in South America, you have two very, very well-known um, uh, companies, Natura and Boticario. Natura, who recently bought uh, Body Shop. Uh, Boticario, who is a, a private company in, in Brazil. They understand the, the local market, and they really dominate the local market in, uh, in Brazil. So they understand the consumers, they're close to consumers, and very, very difficult for multinationals to, to enter that market. Just a few minutes now on, on the network. Um, you know, we are a, a Swiss quoted company, but um, you know, we have a very, very local presence. And you know, just give you a few, um, a few facts and figures. If you look at the split of our presence in what we call high growth versus uh, mature market, so we have uh, just under 100 locations around the world, 50% of our locations in what we call high growth markets. 18 of our production sites, so half of our production sites are in high growth markets. We produce in China not because it's cheap, and you've heard that it's uh, getting more and more expensive. We produce in China because we make to order, and our customers typically expect a lead time of between seven to 10 days. Okay? So very, very t fast turnaround. Um, and so we produce in China because we want to be close to our customers and we want to react quickly to what's happening in the market. Uh, we produce in, in, in Indonesia um, simply because you know, we want to be close to our customers and the infrastructure, um, and India is a very good example as well, infrastructure is not strong enough to be able to export into these countries. And you see nearly 50% of our employees uh, today in what we call high growth markets. Our research, uh, basic research, is uh, split between the US, Switzerland, and China. So today we do basic research in China uh, you know, to, to really capture on one of the points made by Wolfgang. Just some of the, um, the investments that uh, we've made, and actually around 80% of our capital investments over the last five years have been in what we call high growth markets. And really going forward, uh, those are the markets that we will continue to invest in. So Latin America, you know, we really invested over the last uh, five years, uh, particularly in Brazil and uh, also in Argentina. In China, we opened a second flavor uh, facility in a town called Nantong. Maybe you don't know uh, Nantong. Um, Jonathan does know it, actually. It's a city of uh, six million people just north of, uh, of Shanghai, so more or less, uh, just uh, slightly less than the population of, uh, of Switzerland. Um, India, we will open a second manufacturing facility uh, this year in uh, Pune, so just outside of Mumbai. And uh, actually, last year, we opened labs in, in Pakistan. And you see that we, you know, we're not just opening production facilities. What our customers want to do is they want to be able to come into the labs and they want to develop local products that fit with local consumer needs. They want to be able to do it quickly. They don't want to travel. So they really want to be able to go and speak to, let's say, local employees of Vichyvedon who understand the market. So we don't have expats in Pakistan. We have local people who understand food and beverage, who understand HPC, and they develop, they develop products for the, for the market in Pakistan. Uh, Singapore, we actually opened a second fragrance school. So for those of you that know Givaudan, we have a first perfume school in Paris um, where we take a, a number of graduates every year. We take around three or four graduates per year. They spend four years in the school where they learn about perfume um, and then they go um, and work in different markets. And Singapore is actually our second uh, school, so it's actually a satellite of our, of our uh, school in Paris. And the reason that we, wo we opened in, in uh, Singapore is because of the demand in Asia for people that understand what's happening, what, what um, uh, countries in Asia want from a cultural pr preference in terms of fragrance. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we continued to expand in, in Singapore. Singapore is really one of our hubs in, in Asia. And then finally, on the right, you see where we've opened in, uh, in particularly Africa and Middle East. Uh, actually, in 2016, we continued to open offices in Nigeria, uh, Ivory Coast, and, uh, and Algeria. 
a um, you know a company that is is well balanced, and you know if we if you look back over the presentation over the last ten minutes, fifty percent of our sales in fragrances, fifty percent of our sales in flavors, so very very well balanced in terms of the split between uh, the two sectors. Uh, fifty five percent of our sales today in what we call mature markets. It's interesting, you know, we talked today about high growth. Ironically, this year is the first year where our mature markets grow faster than our high growth markets. Um, so uh, maybe not, not the best subject of, uh, for, for, for today. Um, but if you look back historically over the last seven years, what we call our high growth markets typically grew between four and five, four and five times as fast as mature markets. And particularly during the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, all of the growth came from our high growth markets. In terms of customers and products, extremely well spread. Uh, today we produce around 60,000 products per year. So taste and smell, very, very local. If you drink a carbonated soft drink today in the US, it's different to a carbonated soft drink in Mexico. The sugar is different, it's coming from a different source, and, and consumers want different, uh, different tastes. And around 15% of our products change every year. So every year we need to innovate, every year our, our customers are looking for an innovation. In 2016, actually 90% of our growth came from what we call local and regional customers. Okay, so a strong presence with local and regional customers. 50% of our sales today are with what we call local and regional customers. And, um, you know, currency, we are um, naturally well hedged. Actually, we sell in the U.S., 25% of our sales in the U.S. We produce in the U.S. and we, we source in the U.S. Just on, on sourcing, um, we buy 10,000 raw materials a year. Um, about 50% of our raw materials are synthetic, 50% are natural, um, and we buy from many, many countries. So we buy uh, a plant uh, called Ylang Ylang, very similar to the, to the plant that you showed at the beginning, a small yellow flower coming from the Comoros Islands. Uh, we source vanilla from Madagascar. We source clove from uh, Indonesia. We source mint from India. Um, so, you know, Many countries are part of our supply chain, and our customers today, not only do they want uh, security of supply, but they also want ethical uh, sourcing. They want to make sure that their supply chain is well protected and that we're not using um, uh, child labor as an example. So a strong focus on origination and a strong focus on sourcing. Just a, a couple of numbers for the financial uh, community. Um, you saw our 2020 strategy and what does it mean in terms, of, uh, in, in terms of growth. So we aim to grow on average 4 to 5% um, over the next five years. Last year we grew at 4.2%, so that was the first year of our five-year cycle. We, um, we focus very much on free cash flow conversion. Um, so as I said, we're not focused on, on EPS. Um, we expect to deliver between 12 and 17 percent of free cash flow over the next five years, and um, you know something that is uh, you know is probably very relevant, particularly in Switzerland today. We pay a, a dividend which has increased uh, year on year since the spin-off. We pay that in Swiss francs, uh, so that's probably a currency that you do recognise. Um, so we pay a Swiss franc, a hard currency, uh, uh, currency dividend. With that, I'd like to thank you for uh, listening and uh, look forward to the questions. Thank you very much.